Testament reading is Psalm 112, verses 1 through 9. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 563. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who dwell, deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in the triumph of their foes. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. The next scripture reading comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. <clears throat> you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. The city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand, and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they see the good things that you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. I don't even begin to think that, or think that I have come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. And therefore, whomever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've always kind of found this statement uh, from this section of Matthew to be a little odd. I mean, what wonderful positives can we really think of when it comes to salt? We recognize it as a preservative and something that can potentially add flavor or a, kind of enhance a meal in some way. But how exactly does it apply to us? Are we to preserve our records, our attendance and minutes from meetings as we do so faithfully as Presbyterians? Is that what this really means? Are we tasked with adding a bunch of flavor into the world through the way we dress, through our art, our dance, or create some sort of humor or enjoyment? Are we supposed to just remain in the background and not have a high visibility aspect to us and do our work without taking much notice from other people? The possibilities are endless and the questions are even more abundant than we can probably think of in regards to us being the salt of the earth. One angle of the salt is the understanding that salt is just about everywhere. I mean, it can be harvested in mines and found at dinner tables or restaurants and grocery stores. It occurs naturally in some foods and it's been known to make an appearance or two on our skin. Should we be crying or sweating or suffering from some minor fit of rage? What's also intriguing about salt is the sheer amount of it. And how that impacts its noticeability too. If we put too much salt on something and have a giant mound of salt on our steak, then that's going to be the first thing we taste. And it'll go from the tip of our tongue down to our toes and make us kind of pucker up a little bit, thinking, why do we have so much salt on this? And if we have none at all, it might reduce some of the flavor of the meal in which we're trying to enjoy. So we notice its distinct lack of presence as well. In fact, I recall one time uh, eating at a restaurant in France with my relatives from England. Uh, we were fortunate enough to travel there shortly after high school and spend a week or so with these friendly uh, family friends of ours. We really enjoyed ourselves, scoping out the scenes and sights of London, uh, a lot of the local castles and old-fashioned castles that were around, and uh, some other nice English locales. Uh, well, one day we all decided to make a quick journey over to France through the English Channel. 
And we ended up taking this approximate a two-hour tunnel train ride uh, to, and found ourselves well, driving along France's coast. Now, I can't recall the name of the specific town we ended up to save my life, but I, I checked the maps and the channel ports in a town called Calais, France. So I'm just going to assume that's what the town was. So for storytelling purposes, let's say we were in Calais, France, this nice uh, coastal town in France, right? And now, on this day, they happen to have the cyclist tour coming through. It's kind of like the Tour de France, although not as large. Uh, there's kind of these smaller circuits, but all these cyclists just uh, biking through town, up and down these hills, flying around. The townsfolk were loving it and enjoying it, and we had a nice time seeing those sights and checking out the coast. Uh, well, eventually the time came for us to eat, right? Uh, as a teenage boy, I'm always quite hungry and still kind of am to this day. Uh, so we tried to find a place where we could eat. We saw this restaurant offering this nice six-course meal. We thought, wow, what a great deal. We'll eat in France, have some nice French food, and enjoy this brief six-course meal. Well, first entree, or first uh, course comes out. It's some calamari. Makes sense. It tastes very good. We're from a town that's a coastal seafood-faring town in France. And next we have a salad, and then, of course, a bowl of soup or something of that nature. And then finally we get to the main dish. Uh, it looks delicious. Fish, crabs, all these nice things they probably plucked out of the sea just this morning. So I was enjoying the food. There was one thing that kind of stuck out to me about the food. There was a distinct lack of salt in it. It probably had more salt when they pulled it out of the ocean than it did on my plate that day when I was eating it. So I just noticed, I was thinking to myself, I could use a little more salt, right? So I noticed the salt wasn't there. So the two main things that I got from this six-course meal in France was one, that it needed a lot more salt, especially as an American salt lover, right? And then two, this whole meal took three hours. Like, man, the French really take their time and enjoy it, right? Well, good thing we didn't have anywhere else to go. But those really stuck out to me. No salt. So I noticed it wasn't there, so it impacted my food and my meal overall. Either way, when something lacks salt... When it comes to eating, we usually notice it, right? And having that lack of salt didn't make the meal bad, per se, but I just really remember noticing it and having that fact about it. So one would think that something so seemingly small and insignificant as salt really wouldn't matter if it was not there. Yet, I happened to notice. And so that, for me, is a greater message that we can find in regards to salt, and our obligation to being the salt of the earth in this whole equation. And maybe, just maybe, if our goal is to be the salt of the earth and make it better in whichever way we can, that's what we should do. Uh, maybe by avoiding being the salt of the earth, we're not really doing our part or fulfilling God's calling to be God's faithful disciples. So in this case, we must then consider, how exactly are we to be the salt of the earth? And we recognize the presence of our salt is paramount and necessary, but how do we go about being that salt? What are some steps or methods that we could take or actions that we could do or implement in our life to ensure that we're fulfilling God's calling to be the salt of the earth? And for that, I feel we get the best answer from a recent article I read regarding an interview with the late but well-known Eugene Peterson. A while ago, someone asked the preacher, and writer Eugene Peterson, what he would say if he were writing what he knew would be his very last sermon. He replied, I think I would want to talk about the things that are immediate and ordinary. In the kind of world we live in, the primary way that I can get people to be aware of God is to say, who are you going to have breakfast with tomorrow? And how are you going to treat that person? Peterson suggests that we need to stop thinking that being a Christian means we're only being a part of obvious religion context. We instead need to just pay attention to what the people around us are doing most every day and help them to do it in ways that we can glorify God. So in my last sermon, I guess I'd want to say, go home and be good to your spouse. Treat your children with respect. Do a good job at work. We need to be the salt in the real world, and that involves genuinely being with real people, listening to them well, and treating them as the little images of God that we all are. So maybe that's where Christ is calling us to be, to be ordinary, regular, 
a loving people, and to look at what we can do in our daily lives to make a difference. It doesn't always have to be world-changing or life-altering to make a difference in someone's life. So we don't have to always perform CPR or save someone's life with a Heimlich maneuver to make a difference in their life. And maybe it involves treating our significant others or spouses or friends with mutual respect, love, and endearment. And perhaps that means that we maintain our integrity and do our best at work no matter what the circumstances might be. Or maybe it simply boils down to treating someone else as we would want to be treated. As cliche and as old as that golden rule is, maybe that's just where we start. And so maybe our goal for being a salt is to call up a longtime friend that we haven't spoken to in a while and invite them to lunch or breakfast. And then from there we share kindness and compassion and don't hearken back to previous hurts or hostilities in our life. And maybe our being the salt entails us being intentional with our compassion, our listening, and our acts of kindness. And maybe by listening to that frustrated clerk that's ringing us up at Publix, we can make their day just by listening and without offering words of condemnation or judgment, just by hearing them out. We might just have to find a way amidst the ordinary and the everydayness of our lives to squeeze some salt in to make someone else's life better, even through the simplest and easiest of actions. And that's all it really takes, to be honest. These everyday actions of goodness, kindness, mercy, and love, and compassion. And this morning we uh, celebrated Scout Sunday at the 9 o'clock service. We figured we'd try it. Uh, with one service this year, and just kind of see how that goes with uh, Helen and myself. So uh, their sole motto is, on my honor, I will do my best and do my duty to God and my country, and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Does that not sound like a great rubric for being the salt of the earth? And that's from the scouts, Right? So maybe we could follow that. Or maybe we could do what they do. So that based upon our word and our honor, we will do our best for God and for this country. Following the scout law means that one is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And that's only in the first 27. No, that's the, that's the whole thing. But it really encompasses it all, Right? You see, we'll commit to helping people at all times, especially during the ordinary, regular life moments. And we'll commit to keeping ourselves physically and mentally and morally sound. And I'd also like to add a spiritually and emotionally healthy as well as a pastor. And so then doing that, we really can be the preserving and flavor-adding salt of the earth. You see, when Jesus is encouraging us to be the salt of the earth, he truly wants us to cover each and every inch of ordinary with it. So through our actions and through our words, we can do our best to make everything better. But to remind other people that they matter too. Whether they feel unimportant or frustrated that day, it, it's beside the point. We can offer our friendliness or work on it if we feel it's not quite up to snuff. We truly can treat others with respect and give them the time of day, despite how we might currently feel about them or whether or not we've been hurt by them in the past or not. And so in these ordinary, everyday moments, we have the opportunity and chance to showcase God's love and mercy and be that salt of the earth. Or we can be the salt of peace when we make amends with those that have hurt us or others in the past or with those that we have hurt ourselves. We can be the salt of compassion when we, when we listen to someone's story, whether or not we might want to hear it that day. And so at the very least, we should do our best to cover as much of this world as we can with our ordinary, everyday love, grace, and mercy. And through our presence, people can feel that and notice whether we have too much salt or whether we don't have quite enough. So maybe then we ask ourselves, maybe we just need a little bit more salt today. And maybe we need to be a little more kind or a little more compassionate or have our ears open to whoever might be wanting to talk to us that day. 
Well, that's how you become the strong salt of the earth. That's how we preserve it. That's how we add that flavor. That's how we make this place that other people want to be. Us, God's disciples, the true salt of the earth. Amen.